there's also a third photograph that my Aunt Maud had, and that's this one, um, with all of the five boys. Um, so I could identify the family members, um, but I knew no more about the context um, for this one either. Um, I don't know whether Ted just got to pose with his brothers or what the situation was. Um, the next thing I found was, um, the next was a copy of an obituary that my Aunt Maud had saved. And it's always handy to have an unmarried sister as the keeper of the family paperwork. The obituary clipping with, of course, no date or newspaper um, was for my great uncle, William. Um, he was the one on the right. Um, it lists the usual dates and places, names his clubs, says he died in a local institution after an illness of more than a year, names his wife and brothers, but not his sister or his son. Uh, my mother told me he died of tuberculosis, but it's the last sentence that was most important for my quest. For several years, the deceased and his brother were local basketball champs under the banner of the Lin Y. One more piece of information. So first step, um, call the Lin YMCA and see if they have any information on its history. Well, no luck. Um, several nearby Ys had merged and the folks in charge knew nothing about its oral history, its early history. When I tried Google and I did find a photograph of the building, it still stands in Lynn. It's the Masonic Hall now, but it was the Y from when it was built in 1880 until 1907 when the Y moved to a new building. So I knew where the brothers had played basketball. My next step call the Lynn Public Library and talk to the reference librarian. We all love reference librarians. And we, and we know that reference librarians are our very best friends. Um, I gave her the approximate dates in the fall and winter of 1900, 1901, um, and could she find anything? She called me back some weeks later. I think she'd gone and looked at the newspaper. She couldn't find anything. And I'm, in some ways, I'm not surprised, as you'll see later on. Because she was using she was using microfilms of papers. Um, no luck in Lynn. Next step, learn about basketball. I thought maybe somebody's going to tell me there. I knew it was a fairly new sport um, when the brothers played, and it was invented in Springfield, Massachusetts, in the late eighteen hundreds by a man named Nesmith. I, I thought I was doing pretty well. Does any off the top of your head is that what all of you would have known about basketball if somebody just said, "Yep, that that's about it." Um, the Basketball Hall of Fame is in Springfield. Um, I called them too, but they were no more helpful. In fact, if you call the curator, you get a, a full voicemail every time you call. Um, I, I don't know whether they fired him and nobody was there. I don't know what it was, but I never heard from back from Springfield. Sent emails, sent pictures. I even sent those two, that first picture to them. Nah, nothing. Um, so, um, the next step, of course, is ask Mr. Google. Um, not surprising, there's a lot of information. Um, basketball was invented in 1891 at the International YMC Training School in Springfield, Massachusetts, um, now Springfield College, by James Messmith as a way to provide winter exercise for a group of students. Let's see, is the next one going to be? Yes, there he is. Um, it seems that the group consisted of older students and they were not interested in mandatory physical education class. Are we surprised? The head of the department gave Zinesmith the challenge to invent a game that would engage these reluctant students. The leaders of the group were two older students in the business program named Patton and Mahan. Um, he tried a number of variations on existing games but none were successful. And then finally, one December day in 1891, um, perhaps the 21st, after several days of rain had kept the young men indoors at the YMCA training school, um, a Canadian physical education student, James Nesmith, made one last try to devise a new game to entertain the gym class. And this isn't one of those cases where the, you know, the last one works so you don't try anymore. He'd given up. This was it. He was not going to try anymore after he tried this last one. 
Um, he obtained two peach baskets from the school custodian and hung them from railings on opposite ends of the gymnasium in order to give the young men adequate exercise and at the same time hold their interest, he drew up a set of 13 rules. Mm -hmm. We have 13 rules here? Oh no, this is James Nesmith with his, with his peach basket and his ball. Somebody looked at the picture and said, I can't believe that ball must weigh a ton. It's a, <laughs> um, and there are the rules. And I, I tried to get a, a better image but they're all blurry. So I do have a typed copy if anybody's interested in what those 13 rules were. The purpose behind the rules were to have a game that nobody got hurt, everybody had to move, um, and that there would be no roughness and that it would be something that would be inter entertaining in some ways, which was, you know, I guess throwing a ball in a basket, peach basket was entertaining. Um, the 13 rules had them typed and posted them on the bulletin board. Mahan noted for his physical vigor and strength scoffed at the new game, but he soon realized that it was a hit with the others. What happened next was written by James Masmus in his book called Basketball, Its Origins and Development um, that Nesmith wrote in 1941, you know, 50 years later. Um, it was shortly after the first game that Frank Mahan came to me before class hour and said, you remember the rules that were put on the bulletin board? Mm, yes, I do, I answered. They disappeared, he said. I know, I replied. Well, I took them. Um, I knew this game would be a success and I took them as a souvenir, but I think now that you should have them. Mahan told me that the rules were, written, were in his trunk and he would bring them down later. That afternoon, he entered my office um, and handed me the two typewritten sheets. I still have them in 1941, and they are one of my prized possessions. And just interestingly enough, they're now in the archives of the University of Kansas. I don't know why they aren't at Springfield College. And I looked on a website and they're listed among the most valuable documents in the world, like on the same list as the Gutenberg Bible and um, a copy of the Declaration of Independence. I mean, um, um, at the Christmas vacation, um, a number of the students went home and some of them started to play the game in their local YMCAs. There were no printed rules at the time and each student played the game as he remembered it. It was not until January, 1892, um, that the school paper called the Triangle first printed the rules under the heading, A New Game. This is a little bit later than that. Um, one day after the students returned from their vacation, that same Frank Mahan came to me and asked me what I was going to call the game. Um, I told him I hadn't given any thought to the matter, um, but I was interested only in getting it started. Frank insisted that it must have a name um, and suggested the name of Nesmith Ball. <laughs> That's a real thriller. Um, I laughed and told him that I thought the game that would kill any game. And Frank said, why not call it basketball? Um, we have a basket and a ball, and it seems like it would be a good name. And that is the way basketball was named. So now I knew about basketball, perhaps more than I wanted to know. But how did he get to Lynn eight years later? I didn't know why I looked for information on Frank Mahan, but he was the connection. Um, let's see if I, oh, nice handsome young man. Um, there's a brief biography that I found. Again, look on Google. You never know what you're going to find. After leaving Springfield, Mahan was the secretary of the YMCA in Charlotte, North Carolina, making major improvements to the game and programs. During the Spanish Civil War, he took part. Um, he took charge of YMC work camps um, with great success and he was regarded as one of the best YMCA secretaries in the nation. After his wartime service, he was noticed by officers of the Lynn, Massachusetts YMCA. They recruited him and he was named secretary in 1899, rejecting offices of more rewarding positions elsewhere. Now, I knew the outline of the story, but few details. I knew the names of four of the players, 
um, that they likely learned to play basketball from the newly hired general secretary at the Lynn YMCA, who had named the game, and they were champions in 1900-1901. Last July, I received an email from newspapers.com listing the newspapers they had added to the collection. Among them was the Daily Item from Lynn, Massachusetts. And I was so excited, I thought, this is it. I drove right in. And then as now, the indexing can be iffy. If people have worked on newspapers.com, you never know. For one thing, you find something one time, you go look for it again, no. Um, I was very lucky on my first try and not so lucky when I tried again, when I wanted to make pictures of them for this presentation, no. So here is, here is um, I entered Emory, um, the date 1901, and Lynn, Massachusetts. I figured the baseball, the basketball season had ended by the spring of 1901, um, and this is the result. As you can see, all this, this, um, there were um, 234 entries, and I started at the beginning, going one by one by one, and the something this group of people that come up several times um there's some kind of a shooting group and somebody named emory shot with them and they got lots of coverage i think of the 234 um about a quarter of them or maybe even more are about results of the shooting with somebody named emory who were shooting um i didn't want to put the first names in only because there were too many you know, with with the four brothers and whatever, I thought, no, let's just make it easier. But, um, and I and I don't have any idea who these folks are. They're not, as far as I know, they are not relatives of mine. Um, but I found three articles about the YMC basketball team. The first one: the closing basketball game in Saturday night league series was played after the usual classwork Saturday evening. The Sioux defeating the Apaches by a score of 33 to 24. The Sioux having won eight games and lost none stand at the head of the list and will be awarded the handsome silver cup, which my grandfather was holding in that photograph. And they made a total of 211 points in 28 games, not exactly high scoring. Um, it's interesting to note that the team is composed of five men, four of whom are brothers, the Emery's. A younger brother is now a member of the boys department of the association, being too young to play with the elders. Otherwise, the team would be composed of five brothers. And then it says the cup is now on exhibit at Hills and will be awarded on Wednesday evening, March 20th, when the Cooper class and winners of the league series will play a match game. So, March 21st. Um, the Sioux ambushed. The Cooper class basketball team of the Washington Street Baptist Church added another game to its list of winnings. Wednesday evening, when they administered a defeat to the Sioux um, in the YMCA gymnasium by a final score of 16 to 13. The losing team recently won the championship of the YMC Saturday Night League Series and during the evening were presented with the Silver Loving Cup which friends of the association offered at the opening of the game. At the intermission between the periods, General Secretary Mahans stepped to the center of the gymnasium and in a few words, presented the silver cup to the Sioux players. Captain Tom Emery responded. That's my grandfather, I wonder what he said. Yeah. Um, the cup was suitably engraved with the names of the players and the words champions of the Saturday Night League series, 1900-1901. Um, at the bottom of the article, the players are named. F. Smith, William Emery, forwards. Tom Emery, center. Wyatt Emery, Alfred Emery, guards. So now we know who the non-Emery player was, the other guy in the striped shirt, um, the still unknown F. Smith. Finally, only three articles. Um, General Secretary Mahan will give his exposition of associating work, oh, this is May 4th, um, ex of associated work at the East Baptist Church on Sunday evening. One of the most prominent members of the school department of Boston has said this lecture is the best exposition 
of YMC work, a C A work he has ever seen. The growth of the YMCA in this city since its inception, and more particularly in recent years, will be graphically shown at the Jubilee Convention to be held in Boston in June. The special committee appointed to arrange a suitable exhibit have decided to show examples of work from each department. In the physical department, the championship banner captured at Taunton will be shown, also a frame and cast a case containing Lynn's trophies a group photograph of the Emory boys who compose one of the basketball teams. And that is my photograph. Um, I'd answered my questions better than I had ever hoped I would, um, but I kept hunting just for my own curiosity. I looked for more information on Frank Mahan. Um, um, on Frank Mahan in hopes basketball would be mentioned, but there was nothing. There was no discussion about him in basketball. But I found this article with this picture. It, you forget that newspapers used to have drawings in them. You know, this is a, um, it's a it had biographical information and complete with a drawing. Um, and it was from September 14th, 1899, when he came to Lynn for an interview to be the general secretary. And he was appointed and began in noon, noon on October 2nd 1899. So we've got, we finally have, we have Frank Mahan in Lynn a year before this basketball happened. And then I found on Saturday, November 3rd, 1900, which this was, I'd been looking in 1901, so I hadn't found this one. The teams have been chosen and named, and the basketball season will open this evening with a game between the Comanches and the Apaches. Members of the winning team this season will be presented with a group photograph, a cup offered as a trophy. The article also named the members of the Sioux, interesting with nine members without Brother Albert, and the mystery F. Smith is now identified as F. L. Smith. A little help. A little, um, um, that's enough for a genealogist to say, okay, let's find him. Um, I thought he would be about the same age as the brothers, and I thought he'd live in Lynn. Um, I entered F.L. Smith, born 1877, living in Lynn in Essex County, Massachusetts. Um, and that's just a regular, that's, that's from Ancestry, um, the federal census, and I just went to the census. And here he is, Frank Lauren Smith, um, living with his parents. Um, he was born in Nova Scotia, the 10th of July, 1877, um, and he died 11th of February, 1841, and he's buried in um, Pine Grove Cemetery in Lynn. Actually, that's where all my Emory relatives are buried. And Kathy's great-great-grandmother. Um, one more newspaper search. Um, I still wanted to find that obituary for my great-uncle William. Um, it hadn't come up before in my search, and I didn't know why. Um, I searched again. Um, I would have bet money that it was from the Daily Item. And so um, then just playing around, I looked up every Emory up through the 1940s. Um, I knew there would be a lot about my grandfather's post office work and perhaps my mother's graduation from college. And they were all there. There was a whole bunch of fun stuff to just plain read. Um, my mother won an award. She was a, a certified public accountant and she won an award for having the, the highest score on the CPA exam. And there was a big deal of her in the newspaper about you know having won the award and receiving the gold medal and all the rest of that. So it's just kind of fun, things you knew about, but it's interesting to read that perspective from a newspaper. Um, but so was my uncle William's obituary. Um, the one Aunt Maud clipped is on the left, um, and that was from September 8th, 1931. Um, and again, there was another one after his funeral on September 11th, and a longer one, and this longer one that does include his mother, his sister, his son, um, but no basketball stardom. Um, so if I'd only found the second one, it wouldn't have helped me at all, and I would still be back where I was right at the very beginning with a photograph. Um, I haven't done very much work on this family um, because my genealogy focus has always been on my American ancestors. 
and uh, the Emery's were all um, were immigrants from England. Um, but it's also interesting, and this is one of those things that you never really think about. Um, this is a family that never grew. You know, people talk about, you know, there's two people and then there's eight people and then there's 40, you know, and you have all these huge families. Um, it is interesting that this family, um, my grandfather and his five siblings had just five children. You can see, kind of this, I've never used my little pointer before. Let's see if I can make a point. Okay, there's, okay, there's my grandfather. You can't see them very well. There's Wyatt. Um, yes, and there's, there's Florence Maud, my aunt, um, Alfred, William, and Ted. Um, so all of the five, the six children, they only had, what did I just do? I just made it go away. Poor Uncle Ted. I don't know how to get to the end. Um, so there's my, my grandfather had two children, um, Frank and my mother, Helen. Um, and then Wyatt had one daughter, Grace, and she had no children. Um, Florence never married. Al had no children. Um, William had one son and, um, Ted and, his, and Agnes had one child and he was, he died at age two. And I just, it was funny. My mother always said to me that there was something wrong with him. But his death certificate said he died of scarlet fever. So I don't know, but he died at two. So we went from, from six to, um, to five. Um, those three children had five children. Um, and then we get to the very end. I only have, I have just um, seven. Um, I have a sister and one, two, three, two first, second, first cousins. So, I mean, the family sort of has gone away. To the best of my knowledge, I have no children. My cousin Jean has no children. Judy has one. My sister had one. And I don't know about the three on the other side. I don't know. Um, I know Mary Ellen had no children on the other side. So um, you wonder about, you know, sort of, I, I assume that uh, Nancy and Bill or Billy um, do have children, but I have no contact with them. So... I told you it would be short. It is. Um, if any have, Betty has any questions sort of about the process, um, you know, I think I tried, you know, it was, I went from nothing and I was so surprised at what I could actually find. And it, and I thought it was a great story. You know, you know, who thinks that the guy who named basketball teaches basketball to your grandfather. And I knew absolutely nothing at all about the basketball, about anything. Um, but then again, um, my grandfather died when I was six. Um, and, um, most of them, they all, they all died fairly young and they were all, ex the only ones I knew, um, my aunt Maud and my uncle Ted, I knew well. Um, and, um, I knew only uncle, knew only uncle Al when he was an old man, um, because, um, he lived in Newton, really. Um, and so we never saw him, but that's, that's my story about my wonderful picture. And if anybody's interested in the in the rules, I brought a, co a typed copy of the rules. Yep. Oh wait, hold on. Okay. All right. The um, the Y training school was that for people to work at the Y? Um, it was it was no, it was it was in general. Um, it was a pro secondary program. The Y's in those points was mostly educational. Um, I think that it was the equivalent of going to like a community college for business. I mean, I think that's what that was at that level. I don't think it was a it wasn't an actual college, but it was a, a training school. And the wives were sort of all over the country. Question and a comment. Did you figure out if those were our Nesmiths, James Nesmith? He was a Canadian. So if it was, it was going to be a long way back if they were connected. I wondered about that when I looked at that. Um, and then the comment is, I totally appreciate the process because if you stopped at one obituary, you would have never found the other information. So sometimes looking at the exact same piece of information from a different source, they'll give you more information. And as much as it pains me to go back and revisit some of these things I've dumped it through Ancestry, new stuff comes up all the time. So I love the fact that this little town and the little 
little place in Massachusetts added their local paper to it's a big to, city well <laughs> comparatively <laughs> no it was a big city it was a it was a big deal city at that time that's and how they added their digital resources that you you know on your Sunday afternoon could find this oh now I have more information to look at so. yeah it's really fun because ancestry keeps adding more and more newspapers and so it's it's interesting to just kind of see the um you know how um you know, it's the Lynn, uh, that poor reference librarian was looking at, you know, she was sort of scanning pages of the newspaper. And those were just little, you know, there were little columns. This, this, you know, this, the fact that she didn't find them does not surprise me at all with the joys of indexing. Indexing is a wonderful thing. I got the latest uh, Maine Genealogical Society magazine, and I saw that you were giving a talk on um, photography. My ancestry is all either in Lewiston, up around the Passamaquoddy Bay area and so on. So I haven't been participating here. I came in because I was interested in what you might have to say about photographs, but I had no idea you were talking about basketball. And this, this young woman says, oh, are you a basketball fan? And I, why in the world would she ask me that? Because I am a Jayhawk fan. And uh, you know, I lived for 41 years in Lawrence, Kansas where the main boulevard on campus is called oh, Naismith yes. Drive. Yep. And it is very definitely pronounced Naismith, Naismith. there. Yep. <laughs> and it might have been then, I don't know. Those rules you were talking about are not in the archives at the University of Kansas. They are in a special basketball museum that's built as the front entrance oh, wow. to Allen Field's house where all the basketball games are played. Yep. And there was, I don't know how many millions of dollars were spent by an alumni to buy an alumnus to buy those rules. And then the building was built to house the rules. I, I'm not surprised. One of the things I thought was interesting about it was that when they talked about that, you know, there's this whole list of all these incredibly valuable documents. And I, and I just laughed about it because I thought, you know, and and then you sort of, it's one, there are no others. There's just that one that the secretary typed up when he asked and stuck it on the bulletin board. And the fact that it has survived for, you know, it's, it's like Dorothy's uh, golden uh, ruby slippers. Yep, yeah. <laughs> but I also wanted to mention that James Naismith was the first basketball coach at the University of Kansas. That's how he got there. And he is the only losing coach they have ever had. <laughs> And further, I was really intrigued by the fact that all those teams were called the Sioux and the yeah. and so on, yeah. because James Naismith, in addition to teaching, bas uh, being the basketball coach at the University of Kansas, was also the basketball coach at Haskell Indian Nations University, or what was called Haskell Institute, yeah. which after Carlisle was closed down, it was the flagship of all the uh, cultural extermination camps that were the Indian boarding schools. Yep. But while he was there, his principal player was a native, uh, his name was Chauncey Arquette. Hmm. And Naismith, in that book you were talking about, credited Chauncey Arquette with introducing defense in basketball. Hmm. He, he, he really showed how de defense was the key to basketball. And he became the role model, the mentor, if you will, of an 11-year-old kid that was there named James Thorpe. Oh, geez. <laughs> yes. Yeah. You know, it's, well, it, thank you for coming. I did, I did, I did say that I was in I Lawrence, did. Kansas for 41 years. I <laughs> can't live in Lawrence, Kansas for 41 years and not know something about basketball. <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> No, it's one of those things like my husband was the photographer. And so, um, you know, that's the so whenever the pictures appeared and I, I must admit that I do. I don't I can't get back to the beginning. There's a way to do it, I'm sure. But um, but that photograph is just and I have no idea how many there were. I mean, if it was one photograph that was made and somehow my grandfather, who would have gotten it, I assume, he was the captain of the team and he had the trophy. I've never seen the trophy. Um, and how my aunt, you know, gave it to his sister um, who kept it literally on her wall. 
the when we found those two pictures, there were that one and the other one is they're this big. Um, um, that one and the one of the family um, were both on her wall when she died at 101. So long after her siblings were gone. So my question is. You said that you did most of your genealogy on your American yes. ancestors. Yep. So does that mean that uh, the grandfather Emery is the it was the immigrant or his what the the, the this dimension I made about there's no discussion about father not being there. The it's there's another story that my grandfather told stories about. Um, having come, that he that he ran away from, he got in trouble in England and ran away um, and came to the United States when he was 17, came to Lynn when he was 17. And you think, oh my God, you know, 17 year old on a book. His aunt lived there. And the stories are, the stories are just really interesting because I've, I've always wanted to go back and take the stories and then find out what the real story is because most family stories have a grain of truth in them. And one of the ones I would give as an example is, you know, his aunt was married to the mayor of Lynn. I mean, you know, that that seems pretty unusual. I mean, they were, you know, sort of middle class folks from England. How did this woman get married to the mayor of Lynn? Well, as it turned out, he was the she was the nanny to the family after his wife died. And he'd been the mayor 25 years before. <laughs> so um, so it was true. She did marry the mayor of Lynn. Um, but. Yeah. And so my grandfather came over. He was the first. He went back and brought the family all over. Um, and, but they came on different ships. But they'd all been here before. I mean, my grandfather and my my grandfather and his father had come over earlier. My my grandmother, my great grandmother came with Aunt Maud when the sister who her sister who married the mayor of Lynn was having a baby. So that Two of them came over when she had her first child. I mean, that's so it, it's sort of an interesting. You don't you think of the stories about the immigrant who comes and never sees his family. You know, you know, you come and you never see your family again and, you know, all of that stuff. Um, but this family went, went back and forth. And Edwin, the father, did, in fact, abandon the family. The story was that Maud was 12 and she could go to work and the boys could take care of their mother. And he went back to England. Came back later in his old age so his wife could take care of it. <laughs> and my grandfather never forgave him, ever. So, yeah. Did families, go to the Did families have to be fairly well to do to keep going back and forth between? Um, they were middle class. Um, when I went, I went to, they came from a place called Stone, England, in, in, in Staffordshire. And I went with my mother and we went to the town. We knew where they lived. We had a postcard and they lived on a, they lived on a road um, that was a, a row of um, two story um, attached houses, you know, row. but they were brick houses on a substantial street. And they had a, they had a, around the corner from them was a very, upper middle class street with bigger houses, um, some of them sort of single family houses. So he was a, the, the father was a, um, I believe he was an, I, I'm not, I'm not, I believe he was an undertaker and a cabinet maker. He used to make the coffins and put the bodies in. Um, and, but there's a, among the documents we have is the sale of the real estate and the property in Massachusetts, in um, England before they came here. But, I, I, it must have been fairly expensive to come back and forth, but they did, you know, and and I know that the the mayor of Lynn was was a, a a fairly wealthy businessman in Lynn, so he may have paid to have Maud and her mother come over, you know, when his child was being born, and you know that kind of stuff. Um, but the 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 nineteen hundred census, which is about the same time that family picture minus. There they all are. Um, and they all typical, I think, of immigrant families. Everybody, they all lived in Lynn. Um, but, you know, at, at one time, somebody was living with somebody. And, you know, that um, Bill, 
the one of them one of them divorced and he was living with his sister-in-law you know so it was there was a lot of that um and my aunt it's interesting enough that my great-grandfather who was a really bastard um when he died he left the three-decker that he owned to Maud, and the, none of the boys got anything she got the house which i thought was very interesting so and she of course who lived in the house the rest of her family but um but she he left her the house and so um you know when she was 90 or so 95 probably when my mother sold that house when she went into a nursing home there was much discussion in the family about how can she, you know how can you sell Maud's house well and you threw us out in the street yeah she, but anyway so but but it's sort of interesting just because I the, the history part I didn't know anything about um and I know a whole lot more about that family than I ever thought I would and if you're interested, I have basketball rules with something on the back and a genealogy chart that you can actually see. The rules. The rules. Oh, sure. You ready? They're long. <laughs> when you saw how big it was on the screen. Number one, the ball may be thrown in any direction with one or both hands. Number two, the ball may be batted in any direction with one or both hands, never with the fist. Three, a player cannot run with the ball. The player must throw it from the spot on which he catches it. Allowance to be made for a man who catches the ball when running at a good speed if he tries to stop. It's always not, you don't fall on your face. The ball must be held in or between the hands, the arms or body, but not be used for holding it. Five, no shouldering, holding, pushing, tripping, or striking in any way the person of an opponent shall be allowed. The first infringement of this rule by any player shall count as a foul. The second shall disqualify him until the next goal is made or there was, or if there was evident intent to injure the person for the whole of the game, no substitute allowed. A foul is striking the ball with a fist, violation of rule three, four, and such as described in rule five. Seven, if either side makes three consecutive falls, fouls, it shall count a goal for the opponent. Consecutive means without the opponent in the meantime making a foul. How do you ever remember these rules? Eight, a goal shall be made when the ball is thrown or batted from the ground into the basket and stays there, providing those defending the goal do not touch or disturb the goal. If the ball rests on the edge and the opponent moves the basket, it shall count as a goal. Nine, when the ball goes out of bounds, it shall be thrown into the field of play by the person first touching it. In case of a dispute, the umpire shall throw it straight into the field. The thrower in is allowed five seconds. If, if he holds it longer, it shall go to the opponent. If any side persists in delaying the game, the umpire shall call a fall, foul on that side. 10, the umpire shall be in charge of the men and shall note the fouls and notify the referee when three consecutive fouls have been made. He shall have power to disqualify men according to rule five. 11, the referee shall be judge of the ball and shall decide when the ball is in play in bounds to which side it belongs and and shall keep the time he shall decide when a goal has been made and keep account of the goals with with any other duties that are usually informed <laughs> performed by a referee 12 the time shall be two 15 minute halves with five minutes rest between the side making the most goals in that time shall be declared the winner in case of a draw, the game may, by agreement of the captains, be continued until another goal is made. Um, and what I thought was interesting about that is there's no discussion about how many people are on a team. And I read somewhere when I was reading through, as many as would fit in the place that you were playing. And there was no, and there was no designated size of the court. So if you were in a really big space, the first game I believe was, that was played, I think had nine on a side. Um, 
I don't know. It, it, it's funny, by, by 1900, it was down to five. Although that first list, when they said how many people were on the team, I think there were nine people listed that were going to be on the team. So I don't know at what point it went from being, you know, however many you want to, to whatever, and then down to, to five on a side. Yep. Sharon? Soon the basket lost its bottom. There's a there was a photograph, a, a drawing I saw of a of a and I think it was it was early on. It was I think in the early 20th century, there was a drawing of a what looked like a looked like a colander. It's <laughs> gonna you know, this round colander with a ring, and it was on a it, you could either mount it on the wall or you could pay more money and get one on a stand if you wanted to play outside. But it, but it was on a, it was on a pivot, and it had a, it had a, um, a rod on it, and you pull the rod, and the ball would then fall out. That's how, so you didn't have to climb on a ladder and pull it out of the peach box suit anymore. So this was the modern way to go. You could pull the, you could pull the rod, and it would dump it out. Um, I don't know when it was open, when they became open at the bottom, and you could fall it through. So my. A uh, companion here also has something about the peach basket, but um, before he says that, my mom and dad uh, said that when they were growing up on uh, Deer Isle, that they used to play basketball. In fact, my mom played basketball in the upper level, the second floor of the town hall. That was the basketball, uh, yeah. yeah, small, probably be like a half court now, but they used a basket with the bottom taken out, but there was still the rim or whatever it is that you call it around the basket to hold it there. And the baskets were attached to the two ends of the second floor of the town hall. Yeah, I mean, that's the, I mean, that was- so this would have been in the 1930s. Yeah, my mother played basketball in college, but I don't know, in high school and college, and she graduated from college in 19, so in the early 30s. Um, but I, I never asked her what it was like. You know, those questions, and Debbie and I were talking earlier about the fact that when we played basketball in the 60s, um, the girls were only half court, you know, girls, you know, you could, we, couldn't, we couldn't possibly overexert ourselves. We could only stay on each half of the court. Um, and and we still play. We got three dribbles. <laughs> three dribbles. Right. And then <laughs> I I wanted to mention that when I lived in Lawrence, Kansas, the main street is called Massachusetts Street. And um my best friend lived on Massachusetts Street in the house that Naismith lived in when he was in Lawrence mm -hmm. and down when he moved in down in his basement there was a peach basket nailed to the the basement wall but his kids played in it and broke it up and I I can't imagine what that would be worth if they hadn't broken it up well that's like the picture of, which I assume must have been in the, probably in the 1940s at the time that book came out I mean he's holding a peach basket I assume it's yep. one of the original ones yep. and uh um and that ball that looks like it would kill you. <laughs> and it wouldn't, it doesn't look like it would bounce. Well, they weren't bouncing, were they? They were throwing. So. One other thing, while, while you were reading the rules, I was uh, reading the newspaper article. And I it reminded me when I saw uh, IORM, that's International Order of uh, the Red Men. Yep. And this was the time that uh, any of you who know uh, Philip Deloria, Von Deloria's son, uh, he wrote a book called Playing Indian that's all about that period and how mm -hmm. Americans were just obs but, really obsessed with naming everything Indians and all these men's organizations. Uh, in Lewiston, my, my father belonged to the Calumet Club, which was all part of that same same yeah. sort of thing where everything was Indian. Yeah, Sunday all of the school. basketball, all of the teams in that league were all named for for various the the Sioux in the Somebody said to me, why on earth would they name Sioux? <laughs> well, then I, when I found Comanche and Apache, then I realized that that was certainly, that's why. Yeah, reading the obituary on the left there. So he he and his brothers were local basketball champs playing under the, oh, uh, wait a minute. I thought I said for many years, for, yeah, for several years. So did you see any other years? Nothing uh, else. Years that I hunted. Pictures? 
Nope, absolutely nothing except that one year with the photograph and the and the trophy. That I and that's why I started looking from I started then looking from 1930 to 19 from from 1902 or 192 because I started at one. I started in two to 1940, and all I found was you know my aunt Maud was at Miss Miss F Maud Emery was at T and. Um, you know, those sorts of the the ones that, you know, so-and-so was visiting so-and-so, um, but not another mention of basketball at all. Um, and it had to be a big deal. 30 years later, they mentioned it in his obit. Well, I wondered whether that was the biggest thing that ever happened in his life, that he had a pretty small... Maud probably wrote the obit. <laughs> no, she wouldn't have left herself out if she wrote the obit. <laughs> One of the places that I have found information like that is to go back and look at the school yearbooks yeah. because they sometimes uh, mention other things as yeah. well. This is this I think is too early because they are they were already well except for Ted who was still in school. But I mean, my grandfather was twenty five, um, and none of them I don't think any of them went to high school. Um, <laughs> I think you went to eighth grade and you went to work because your father had left you and you damn well better go to work and take care of your mother. I was Googling peach baskets and basketball, but instead I came across a James Nesmith timeline. And if you said this, I'm sorry I missed it, but did you know that when basketball was invented, it was inspired by the game called Duck on a Rock? <laughs> no, I did not. Fun fact for today. So fun fact. That's what they were. He was inspiring these rules by in the game as he invented it. Well, I mean, he talked, there was a lot of discussion about, you know, trying variations of soccer, trying variations of everything inside. But he was worried about it being the people getting hurt. That's why all these rules about, you know, no touching, no nothing. You can only throw the ball to each other. You can only catch it in your hands. Because his big concern was people getting injured, um, that he wanted the, the students to get exercise inside and not get hurt. And, you know, he, he talked about, you know, a little ball versus a big ball. Um, there was a whole lot of discussion about what his thoughts went into in terms of, and he found the peach baskets, the custodian found them in the basement of the gym, um, nailed them up. So, gee, and now I know more about basketball than I ever wanted to know. <laughs> oh, hold on. Yes. And they're going to lose the budget. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Hold on. We have somebody oh. in the Zoom. Yeah. Carol, go ahead. Hi, Deb. Hi, Carol. How are you? <laughs> I'm great. Yeah, you are. All right. Uh, question. Well, comment. And maybe the gentleman who came visiting that lived in Kansas could answer this too. But I noticed that in the rules that there was a comment about five seconds to get the basketball or get the ball back into the court. And I think that's the same five second rule we're living with today. A lot of similarities, yeah. yeah. Can he hear me? Yes. yes, he didn't quite know, it's okay. Okay, but I think <laughs> when you inbound a ball, I think you have five seconds to do so or you're penalized again. He I thinks think that's, that's right too. So we got trust a, him. The five, <laughs> seconds is, the five seconds have lasted all these years. <laughs> and I do want a copy of the rules. <laughs> All right, I'll give them to you. Thank you. Basketball team are injured. That's why they went way yeah. down at the end of the season. People do get injured. Yeah. Well, th it's a lot rougher now than it was then. I mean, I think that you got kicked. Through. I think if you bumped into anybody, you were gone. Yeah. Of course, with nine on the side, I can't imagine how they didn't run into each other. I mean... The girls aren't nearly as polite as you. <laughs> I'm sure they are. Knows about the James basketball connection. Hey, Leo, do you know about the James basketball connection? Yes. Nesmith basketball connection? No, she doesn't. Leo, she doesn't. She does not. He was a Canadian, so um, it may very well be that it was a whole nother branch, and you you know they're connected in 1542. I don't remember seeing um, early on, but I thought that the Nesmith name in basketball was N A I. Yes, Smith is Naismith. Yep. So, 
Sorry, but Kathy. That, but that's what that's what the ones here are as well. Yeah, that's what I thought. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think standard spelling doesn't exist. And so, yeah, I mean, it doesn't count. Spelling doesn't count. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you, Deb. This is wonderful. I will tell you what's really fun to do this research. All right. Thank you, people on Zoom.